Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. I'm Lydia Wilson, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. The word medieval conjures up all kinds of images to different people. Here in the UK, you might think of the rollicking tales of pilgrims on their way to Canterbury, written by Geoffrey Chaucer in the late 14th century. Or you might have a sense of the poverty of peasants getting by on subsistence living from strips of land, living in simple and small dwellings. Or you might recall the violence of the Crusades, with armies sent from Europe to the Holy Land to conquer Jerusalem. The common usage of the term often contains implications of primitive barbarism, seen in its easy applications to groups such as ISIS or the Taliban. Many still speak of the period as the Dark Ages. But my guest today, Ian Mortimer, wants to rethink much of this and has written a book to do just that, Medieval Horizons, Why the Middle Ages Matter. Having written four medieval biographies and a traveller's guide to medieval England, among many other history books, he has turned his attention to how we think of the Middle Ages as a whole, and that's just the problem. He argues that the very term obscures huge differences within the period, and also leads us to think of modernity as radically different. Instead, he sets out to chart the changes that occurred during what we call the Middle Ages to show how modernity could not have happened without their groundwork. Ian Mortimer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Lydia. Pleased to be here. Now, before we get too deep into events many centuries ago, I wonder whether you could start by explaining why you wrote this book in the first place. What did you notice? What did you want to correct that gave you the motivation? If you're a historian and operating at both a scholarly level and a, in the public sphere, you realise how little people know about the world around them. They tend to make judgments based on the world as it is today and what they hear in the news and things like that. But if you've got the perspective of a thousand years or more, you realise that actually we don't get a very good picture of humanity by just looking at ourselves as we are today. We get a much fuller picture by looking at the past. And so because I'm aware all the time of people using the word medieval in a way which is you know, pejorative. I was thinking, well, if you understood a thousand years, you'd see that most of our development is down to the first part of the last millennium, not the second half. We get obsessed by technology. And because of that, we think of change as technology. But if you look at social change, it's a very different picture. And looking at the Middle Ages as a whole shows you how we could live in very different circumstances and yet thrive and survive and create the achievements that led to, well, ultimately the modern world. Well, I wanted to get to technology because that is at the heart, I, I felt, of your critique. But yes. just before we go there, I wondered if we could set a few parameters. Now, for your book, you chose 1000 to 1600 AD as the period you're calling the Middle Ages. It's not uncontroversial to say that this is a very controversial choice. I mean, both ends of that period are quite unusual in defining the Middle Ages. Can you explain why you chose that? Yes, because that very observation has already shown us we've got set ideas about what the Middle Ages are. I am simply saying, OK, let's scrub everything we know. Let's just imagine we know nothing about the pre-industrial past at all. And let's see how life changed between the 11th and the 16th centuries. Between the time when virtually nobody was able to read and write, apart from a very small number of priests. I mean, in, in, in the British Isles, I estimate it's about 2,000 literate, well, between 1 and 2,000 literate people for the entire um, set of islands. In the 11th century. Early 11th century. Early, uh, yeah. um, so Saxon times in England. Um, and then the age of Shakespeare, because Shakespeare is a very good uh, benchmark for discussing our past, because a lot of people are only really familiar with our medieval past through the characters of the Shakespeare plays. Mm -hmm. uh, he introduces, of course, those characters to wide audiences and uh, did in the 16th century. So Shakespeare's got a good benchmark and the beginnings of literacy and uh, the beginnings of the effects of the what we call as historians the medieval warm period. That's a real a sort of two bookends, as you would say, for medieval change in the widest scope. Now, when people say, as my Italian editors, in fact, my Italian editors eventually turned the book down because they said, we don't think of the Renaissance as medieval. Yes. yes. <laughs> there's a preconception straight in itself. That something's good, so you call it Renaissance. Something's bad, so you call it medieval. Just get uh, rid of all this. 
Are you sure that's the basis for what we call the Renaissance, though? Are you sure you're not just, in a way, creating a new category? That there are reasons to to describe the Renaissance as a separate period, aren't there? No, not really. I mean, when when does the Renaissance start? When does the Renaissance finish? No one can put any dates on that. 12th century Renaissance, does that count as Renaissance? Where's the difference between the 12th century Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance? And, well, they and... are two different Renaissances, it's true. And it's always hard to put dates on things. I do know this. And you've got a, you've created your own grounds for a period. So I do understand it. But then I'd ask you, what would you call the period between the fall of the Roman Empire to the early 11th century, because that for many people is included in the Middle Ages. Oh, absolutely. And I do say in the beginning of the book, you know, it's 1500 years, you, you could, mm. if you're the widest one. If you go from the fall of the Roman Empire, whenever you date that, let's, most, most people go for 476, right the way through to the 15th century, which is the normal end of most people's preconceptions of medievalism, then yeah, that's a thousand years. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to call that all medieval. I'm called, happy to call parts of it early medieval. The mm. labels we put on these things don't matter. They really mm. don't matter because we're looking at the actual past and nobody in the Middle Ages said we're medieval. These are all <laughs> modern constructs. These are yes. all modern bits of imagination. And the more we overlay the past with these constructs and modern imagination uh, elements, the more we're actually getting away from the past. We're, we're actually putting yeah. barriers to our understanding. And that's the point. If we come to this with the idea of medieval bad, medieval non-technological, medieval this, medieval that, we're actually escaping a, a closer integration with how they changed and what they did I I in terms of social development. Because there's no cutoff points in social development. Kings yeah. may come and go. And the medieval warm period came and went. And the Renaissance in whatever one where you want to describe it, describe it comes mm -hmm. and goes and filters mm -hmm. out and fades out um but i mean we're looking at a period without any hard and fast borders i really wanted to focus on and the easiest way for me to to do that was to start with the the very violent culture that was the early 11th century and the, the suffering that was then mm -hmm. in contrast with uh, the age of shakespeare yeah. Now, so far, we're only one word into the title. <laughs> but the second word of the title, Horizons, really frames your book, doesn't it? Can you explain why you chose Horizons for both the title and the framing? Yeah, I, I, I did this long process of thinking, how am I going to get people to understand social change when they automatically think of change as technological progress. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, asked to do a talk celebrating 1100 years of the Diocese of Exeter, where I live. Uh, and I agreed on, and I decided to do which century of the last 11 saw the most change, which led to a different book called Centuries of Change. Now, the night before I was due to give that uh, talk, I was in the pub with a, a, a friend, and I said, you're going to come along and hear this talk. And he said, well, no, I don't need to uh, do that. And he, as so many people do, he got a mobile phone out of his pocket. He said, if I want to, I can have a conversation with my brother in Australia right now, and you can't tell me any century has seen more change than the 21st. Yeah. And I pointed out to him that long-distance telephone calls are a feature of the 19th century, and a conversation <laughs> with his brother in his own language isn't exactly novel. <laughs> and um, the, the, the whole idea of a mobile phone and having a conversation is a, a summation of technological developments that have taken for much, much longer. And yeah. then I pointed out, that he'd actually been born in Cornwall, and 1,100 years earlier, it wasn't even part of England. And I say, you're, the fact you're part of England is not consequential too. We overlook so many of our fundamental things. So therefore I thought, how can I have a benchmark, a, a, a series of benchmarks, a, a measuring device, which is more appropriate for measuring social change than technology, which people use as a default? And it struck me that I could do this by looking at our awareness of the world. And I was particularly uh, focused on the um, mid 15th to the mid 16th century development of our knowledge of the world. Yes. So now we didn't have a very good knowledge of the world in the, um, at the start of the 15th century. And, and we rapidly advanced that over the course of the 15th century. By the end of the century, people had crossed the Atlantic. They had gone across the Indian Ocean. And of course, by 1521, an expedition had gone all the way around the world. Mm. And by the end of the 16th century, you know, two English uh, uh, captains had sailed all the way around the world. Yes. So that sense of horizon, I thought, that metaphor actually allows us to look at social change in a non-technological way. And if you apply it to horizons of memory, then 
memory we, we have so much more memory written words in all its forms by the end of the 16th century than we did in the early 11th yeah and we've got so many more avenues of learning so much more knowledge in terms of science medicine i mean you name it just legal memory in yeah. the early century you don't have the written records you can go to court and present evidence but you do in the later centuries so i thought the horizon of memory the high horizon of how people far people travel how far their yeah. merchandise travels all these things was a much better metaphor for understanding social change than um, anything else i could think of yeah i do wonder how specific it is when you're looking at changing horizons whether that's as you say, knowledge, horizons, memory, horizons, uh, medical, how specific they are to a geographic area. And I ask this because I just read a fascinating book. I wonder if you've read it. It's The Wife of Bath, a biography by Marion Turner. And it takes Chaucer's brilliant and life-loving character, the wife of Bath. And the, mm. the first half of it situates the character in her historic context. Yeah. And something that emerged very clearly amongst other lots of brilliant things is that the wife of Bath's position as a confident woman in control of her own business and her own life, you know, choosing to go on pilgrimage, she was very much a product of England. Her equivalent mm. in Italy, for example, would have had nothing like her freedoms at exactly the same time. Time. So yeah. to what extent is your argument really about England rather than the Middle Ages in Europe or globally? My arguments are very general and I use England heavily because I'm an English historian and all of the, the sources mm. that I understand most intimately are going to be English as a matter mm. of course. Now, when it comes to continental Europe, yes, there are lots of points where I can draw on similar things where I can find echoes and parallels and contrast. I mean, you mentioned Italy there and Italy's, you know, throughout the book, I'm saying, well, Italy's the exception here. You know, the, <laughs> right. Italy is, is so often the exception because they never lost the, the sense of trade and the sense of city living being. The, maybe. The, of course. Sorry to interrupt, but maybe that's why your Italian publisher didn't love this book. Oh, well, yeah, maybe. But, <laughs> Just to focus then on Italy, and I missed the major points. And the major points of the book are about how we understand change and how the West developed so much more in the period 11th century to the 16th, which is just as true of Italy as it is of anywhere else in Europe. You know, mm. the, 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 the 16th century gave us a lot of our modern culture uh, mm. in Italy as well as here. I mean, these are the big themes. And to focus too much on where your supporting evidence comes from or where your um, examples come from is in some ways to miss the point. Yeah. You know, just, it's, it's as true for Italy that uh, um, uh, as, uh, as for here that our uh, early navigators began to become familiar with the shape and the, the scope of the world in the, the, the late Middle mm -hmm. Ages. So the big themes are much more important, I feel. There are really important contrasts. And you've just drawn attention mm -hmm. to one, you know, the freedom of in, uh, individual women. I mean, even in the 16th century, visitors to England are constantly referring to how much freedom English, I have to say English women of a certain status, uh, but English upper, uh, well, mid middle class and upper uh, um, class women who have an awful lot more freedom in this country than they do in Germany and in Italy, in many other countries, and it's frequently commented on. At the same time, they are, are, are still the um, uh, victims of a lot of misogyny and mm. sexism, and that is true across Europe too. So although the specifics here are, yes, different, the generalities are in common. And I mm. think we need to focus on the generalities to get the, the big picture, and then we can go down to the specifics and see where the contrasts are. Well, also, I mean, that's the plea for the big picture. But sometimes things become very clear with specific examples. And there are a lot of interesting nuggets that come from your book. And I hope you don't mind me picking up on a few. Because one that jumped out at me, and it's only, I think you only mention it really in passing, but it's so fascinating, was the curious history of mirrors. And yeah. I think I'm writing saying, correct me if I'm wrong, they were common enough in Roman times, but then... Yeah simply stopped being used in the early Middle Ages in Europe. And then they make an appearance again in the 12th century. And yes. you argue that this, which is quite simple technology, really, when you compare what else they had at the time, it had profound implications for developing senses of self-awareness, of individualism, all of which, of course, were very important to human history and especially in modernity. So can you first tell me what are the sources for this odd history of the mirror? How do we know who used them when? 
Well, that's a, that's a really good question because I've gone quite on a, quite a journey with how we write the history of a mirror. I mean, I started <laughs> off like most people, you know, going around museums, and you come across Bronze Age mirrors, and they all yeah. look very fancy. You just think, well, mirrors have always been around, and. <laughs> Then I read that if you actually polish a, a, a copper mirror really well, it reflects something like 15 to 20 percent of the light, which is about the same as you get in a muddy puddle. And then I thought, how much of a mirror image are we really getting? We're getting yeah. a reflection, but it's not necessarily a mirror image. No. So I started looking at then at uh, how do we know about uh, glass mirrors? Well, they were mm -hmm. invented in the second century AD in the Middle East, so in part of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were very small and they were used for makeup, apparently. I'm, I'm not a, an ancient historian, but that's what I've read about them. But then they stopped being made with the fall of the Roman Empire and they weren't circulated. And there are no references to mirrors before really the, the last millennium. You don't find Saxon references to mirrors. Right. Think, so just no references in the text. You know, I, have, I haven't come, come across anything. I imagine that if you're a wealthy, high, very high status, you could have a polished piece of silver because they had plenty of silver. So if you had a polished piece of silver, I imagine they did exist, but I haven't come across references to them. And if anybody knows of any Saxon references to mirrors, <laughs> I'd be very grateful to, to see them because this is a long, you know, process of finding out from every place you can possibly find them what, who was using mirrors, where they had them, how much they cost and what they thought of them and what the effects were. So I then, when I was writing Centuries of Change, I focused on this and the development of individualism in the later Middle Ages and correlated it with mirrors. And I was asked by a, a professor of psychology at uh, Southampton University to go and give a, a keynote address to an international psychology uh, symposium on the development of individualism in the late Middle Ages and to talk okay. about mirrors as part of that. So I did a fair bit of research on that looking at how the glass mirror had been reinvented, uh, probably in northern Italy, probably in uh, the Venice area, the Venetian glass uh, yeah. at the end of the 13th century or beginning of the 14th. I, I tend to favour the beginning, end of the 13th, but I've got no proof of that. And later, after that book was published, I talked a lot about mirrors, and I found myself thinking, well, I've only looked in a certain number of museums. What about the archaeological evidence from other museums around the world? So... I then started looking around at uh, where are there mirrors that you can find which would have affected Western culture. And of course, there are lots of references to mirrors as the, the mirror of charity or the mirror oh, of yeah. religion and things like that in literary texts from the 12th century. And there are mirrors and mirror cases that survive from that period. They're not glass mirrors. They're polished metal mirrors again, but they were of metal alloys that allowed a, a much better reflection because they have a silver um, effect. So you have a much more like a, sil a, a, a silver, a uh, polished silver mm. reflection. Yeah. So those would have been practical for women to use. And when I realised that, I thought, actually, this time chimes in with the advent of makeup being used in the 12th ah. century. And then, of course, the earliest references to makeup are people applying their own makeup. You need a mirror to apply your own makeup. So yes. that also fed into this whole idea. And what and, kind of forces are they? Who's talking about makeup? Oh, people who don't approve of it. Okay, people, yep. <laughs> people think you should not paint yourself. It is divine and blessed to, to, you know, to be as the, as the good Lord actually intended you to be. Well, yeah, gilding the lily comes to mind. Well, quite. Well, I think Bernard of Clairvaux was the first earliest writer I found castigating women for wearing makeup and uh, mm. thereby being ungodly by trying to present themselves in ways that uh, weren't as the Almighty had intended them to be. So these mm. chimed in with the whole idea of the mirror. And mm. for me, the important bits of this is not that people were looking at themselves now and they weren't, not that they were you know, able to apply makeup. It's the sense of self and self worth that comes from that sense of self. If you are living in a society where you've got no picture of yourself, yeah. your image of yourself might be your heraldry, it might be your anvil if you're a smith, or the land you operate if you're a peasant. You don't paint yourself in your mind as your face, facial features, because you've never really seen them. Yeah. Um, you paint yourself through a, an image of what you do and what you are and that sense. And what's more, you don't have any relationships or sense of self necessarily outside your day-to-day -day activities but then when purgatory comes along at about the same time in the uh, early 12th century right. 
You are told that if so-and-so prays for you after you're dead, you may well have a chance of yet going to heaven, which means you've got to have a sense of what that other person thinks of you when you're no longer here, mm. which requires a sense of self. So all these things come together at the same time, roughly the, the early 12th century, in terms of the development of mirror and the spread of mirrors, the use of mirror as a metaphor in literary texts, the yeah. use of mirrors practically by women to use apply makeup, and the sense of self in terms of what people are aware other people think of them. Well, so I uh, put all these things together. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a very compelling point. I mean, what I was going to say is that you have a sense of what you look like from what people tell you and how people react to you. And that, again, is serving to kind of anchor you in a community. And I, you describe very well the community of, of the early part of your period, you know, 11th, 12th century, as very much communal living that you absolutely, your life relies on communal living in terms of farming, fighting in all sorts of ways. So I think that sense of self that you gain without a mirror is also communally formed, right? Absolutely. Definitely so. But uh, if you have somebody fashioning you because you can't fashion yourself, you know, for example, applying an early form of makeup to uh, present you, you're dependent on that community in a way that your self is lost within that community. And as for the way people talk about things and talk about appearances, I make a point in a different book, which I've been writing recently, about I could describe this room to you in minute detail and you still would not be able to picture it. So mm. there is that sense of the limitations of language when it comes to that sense of self. Seeing yeah. is believing, I think, is the, 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 the line that sort of jumps out and is necessary yeah. here because that sense of seeing yourself feels... You know, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, it, it fills out those doubts you might have. Yeah. Now, another fascinating aspect of your of, of your different horizons was to do with violence and how you charted the violence over the period that you're looking at. I had no idea. There's you, you start this with the fact about the ninth century king, King Alfred. In, in and out of 77 laws that King Alfred issues, 34, so that's pretty much nearly half, were purely concerned with the compensation for severing limbs and injuring people. And there were other laws on top of that concerned with other sorts of violence like murder and rape. But yeah. so it's obviously a major concern of lawmakers at that time. But then things changed radically, didn't they? Can you explain this trend? I think there is a, a real tension in early medieval society. And by early medieval here, I'm talking about the beginning of this period and also you know, the, the, the Saxon period you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the tension is you need a violent or potentially violent population to be able to defend itself. They have got to have arms around them. They have got to have uh, the skills to fight. They need to be to the guilds, basically, to fight off any invaders. In that case, Vikings, but every yeah. early century had the same problems. And yet at the same time, you don't want hack people hacking each other up and basically disrupting society. So you've got this real tension. And it doesn't really dissipate until the later Middle Ages when that becomes much more resolved in a better quality of law, more, more applicable law, put it that way. It's not so much the threat of being hanged or something like that. It's not the severity of the punishment that puts you off so much as the certainty you will be caught. So we have a much better legal system and that reduces violence. And as violence reduces at a domestic level, we also have this sense that, well, war is not a good thing. By the end of this period, you have many people saying, like Thomas More <clears throat> in Utopia, mm -hmm. war is to be avoided at all costs. Yeah. The only justification for war is if you are invaded. So you have that sense of war being a bad thing, which most people excluding perhaps Putin, uh, <laughs> believe today, you know, that the yeah. world should avoid war at all costs. But that's not something you get in the early Middle Ages because they can't avoid war. It's a feature of everyday life. Yeah. And what you need is a well-defended society. So the Middle Ages, again, is this period that takes us from this sense that war is normal and therefore to be good at war is a good thing. And by implication, great warriors are great people to the other end of the, 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 the um, period, where you've got Martin Luther declaring even the worst peace is better than the glorious war. Yeah. There is no justification for war whatsoever in his views. And people who prosecute war, who, who carry out war, are, are less than human.
Well, there was a sense of that, wasn't there? There's, this is something else you covered that I had no idea about, that there were actual religious penalties for going to war, even when you were fighting in, in the service of your own king or lord or liege, that actually, once you'd killed somebody, you still had to, you still had to account for that action, didn't you? Can you explain that? In theory, the church increasingly took on the role from the 11th century onwards of trying to moderate people's behaviour to be a moral force for good throughout Christendom. And how successful it is debatable. There were movements such as the Peace of God and the Truce of God, which forbade fighting on certain days, looked at fighting as an indulgence that people should avoid on, on certain days, a bit like fasting. They shouldn't actually go to war on certain days. Though one of those days was Saturday and the Battle of Hastings took place on a Saturday. So... <laughs> You know, it wasn't that successful. No. Um, the sense that if you committed an atrocity, you should do penance for it, that's also there in the 11th century. I mean, Fulknera, the Count of Anjou, who is, uh, is now a common ancestor of the English people, because he's an ancestor of all the English kings, he is uh, a remarkably violent man. I mean, he burnt his wife in her wedding gown out of suspicion for, for adultery. He went on two pilgrimages to Jerusalem and founded uh, two monasteries which gave early historians the impression that he was exceptionally pious whereas mm. these are all penances for massacres and uh, similar atrocities so there is that sense of the church trying to maintain good behavior and of course it accelerates under uh, Gregory the seventh when he took on this role of organizing the church in a systematic way across the whole of Europe so that he'd basically be able to hold kings to account and impose moral values on everybody. It was a very slow process, and it reached its zenith probably in the early 13th century and was on the back foot after that. But there is this sort of program of trying to control violence, trying to improve understanding and education. The medieval church was, I think, in many ways, a, a profound force for good and a profound mm -hmm. force for civilization. At the same time as it was promoting the Crusades. Well, I mean, the words you're using, atrocity and massacre, we can understand that religion might want to try and put a break on those sorts of things. But it also applied to things we might not necessarily call atrocity and massacre. I think you've got in your book the penance you have to do if you kill someone on the battlefield. We don't think of that as something you need to atone for. It might be horrible from a personal level. It might be horrible for the society that the, for, of, the, of the victim and all the rest of it. But we see it sort of the grim reality of war. We don't think an individual soldier needs to take responsibility for that. So that's kind of the opposite trend in a way, that we've become more forgiving of violence within what we call the rules of engagement. Mm. So we've got, a, we've got the break on war in terms of violence has definitely been reduced. You have figures to show how much it's been reduced. And we have Thomas More and all those people you've just quoted saying it, it's not good, it's not great, this should be the last resort. But at the same time, we've sort of sanitised it, haven't we? We have sort of sanitised, I agree with you. I mean, when you look at the, the pattern here that I'm putting forward, that we go from war is normal to mm. war is abnormal and to be avoided over the space of those five, 600 years... If we then look in the bigger picture, the last thousand years, so as you're doing, bring it up to date, what we have done is reduce enacted violence. The actual actions of hurting people, killing people, have reduced. This is a theme of Stephen Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, when I criticised that book in Centuries of Change, I said, look, it's not as simple as that. You imagine, and this is the example I use, you imagine that I've got an orchard and people are stealing apples from me and I do nothing about it. Well, there's theft taking place, but no violence. Imagine that I go out there with a big club and start hitting people every time I catch them stealing apples. Well, yeah. maybe they'll still try and steal apples, so there's an amount of theft going on, but there's a lot more violence. And now imagine I'm really good at clubbing people and they're really terrified. They don't steal the apples and there is perhaps no violence. But there's potential for violence yeah. if they do steal the apple. So what we've done is taken the real violence and turned it into a sort of, like, like in physics, going from kinetic to, to, to potential. We, we've actually taken something enacted and then made it a potential. And that is what we have done with our armaments over the last 500 years, well, 600 years from the earliest guns. We have created these threats which are so powerful 
that we use them less and less, with the ultimate being, of course, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So we're very reluctant to use nuclear weapons because it is such an ultimate threat mm -hmm. and ultimately self-destructive for the world. The, the point is that if you only count enacted violence, yes, we've got much more peaceful, but that pretends the physical, the, I beg your pardon, that pretends the potential violence will never be unleashed and you can never be sure that's the case. So yeah. I think in the big scheme of things, yeah. since the Middle Ages, we have created a lot more potential violence yeah. and just locked it up for future generations to unleash. I think that's probably another counterintuitive point that your book makes, that we're not used to thinking about the church like that at all, let alone the medieval church. We hear about them putting breaks on knowledge, of forbidding knowledge, of, of, of maybe many punitive measures. There's more of that potential violence that you're talking about, though, of course, it's in the afterlife, not here on earth, though. Yeah. <laughs> but there's quite a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, and so I wondered if you could flesh out your conception of it as a force for social good. The force for social good from the church, I come down to education above everything else. Uh, mm. The church was the major instigator of establishing the schools, especially in, from the, in the period from the late 12th century through to the late 13th century. I mean, the idea that there should be a, a school in every cathedral and every major town is, I think it's openly stated in the Third Lateran Council, which is 1179. And that triggers um, people being able to read and write. People being able to read and write in Latin, which is a you know, continental-wide language, and therefore share ideas. And that sharing of ideas uh, is really what activates so much learning in the later Middle Ages. You think that um, we think of uh, Leonardo da Vinci as being quite a clever chap, and his, uh, we think of him as unique, although he wasn't. I mean, th we think of uh, his ideas as being groundbreaking. But you look at his flying machines, and who does he credit the idea for? Well, an English friar, Roger Bacon, a member of the church. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> a person who actually experimented with lenses and all yeah. sorts of optics. So we are, yes, you're quite right. And there's a lot of prohibitions in the church. You should not do this. And the church forbidding any of its priests from cutting blood meant there were no uh, or very few clerical surgeons. So or, things like that, you couldn't actually really be a priest and a physician at the same time. <clears throat> it was rather difficult. But on the other hand, you have this promotion of education and the promotion of the sharing of knowledge. And ultimately, of course, that is what leads to the breakdown of the church's control on the morality of society, because it's very much the idea that we should have a Bible in our own language, which we should all be able to read for ourselves, that destroys the reliance on the priest and ultimately the reliance on the Catholic Church. It also allows us to see for ourselves, you don't have to pay lots of money to the Pope in the Bible, because the Pope's not mentioned in the Bible. So all these things actually do... The church basically is its own worst enemy in the long run because it, it, it creates all these educational opportunities for people to go beyond its limits. I think of it as a, a mixed blessing because although I think it's the greatest force for good, I think it's also a great force for evil as well in the world, using evil in a very loose way to refer to antagonizing or justifying war, I suppose, justifying certain sorts of sexism and misogyny. So I think it's, uh, it's a two-edged sword, but it Every bit of the negativity you can find in the medieval church, you can also find something positive. Mm, fascinating. Now, you talk about this book as a tool rather than as a way to understand the whole of the Middle Ages, that actually you're offering a tool to apply. So I just wondered, I don't know if you know, I've got a PhD in the 10th century philosopher Al-Farabi, um, wow who was very active in Baghdad and Damascus, though he comes originally from far further east in the Muslim empire of, right. you know, working under the Abbasids. And so obviously the Abbasid empire at, at that point is quite different to a lot of the characterizations in your book that's yes. more, more focused on Christendom and specifically England. But I wondered, have you been tempted to apply your framework of horizons of change, changing horizons to other parts of the world? I mean, the Arabic world wasn't that far away from Christendom at this point. There was plenty of trade for centuries. There was The Roman Empire set the stage for even not having the division between Europe and the Middle East. And, and you know, the Crusades, yes, they were violent and awful, but they ended up with lots of trade and intermarriage and all the rest of it. So I wondered, have you pushed your own boundaries geographically at all? 
Okay, I'm going to answer that with a little story. And it goes back to when I was at Reading University in the early 1990s. And I was editing, I was in my 20s at the time, I was editing a volume of 17th century documents. And they were very full on daily life in the, the 17th century. There's a volume of probate accounts. And I wrote a fantastic, what well, I thought was a fantastic introduction to this book. And it explored all the various aspects of life as revealed in these documents. And when I presented it to my academic supervisors, I can remember one looking over his top of his spectacles at me and saying very gravely, Ian, you are pretending to knowledge you do not have. Oh, <laughs> cutting. But it was absolutely true because I was writing about a society based on far too limited uh, range of sources, which didn't give all, all different points of view, which were um, only of a certain people at a certain point in life, as in they were approaching death. It didn't flesh out a, the, a lot of the contrasting evidence that I got, uh, well, the details that I got from somewhere else. And because of that, I have a principle that you should never pretend to knowledge you do not have. <laughs> and in this case, don't go beyond your experience. I spent what, 35, 40 years becoming a reasonable historian of England. Right. Now, there's not much point me then thinking, right, I'm going to do the same thing for the Middle East because I'm never going to get as familiar with the sources and more no. importantly, their limitations. And it's understanding the limitations of your source material, which allows a historian, I think, uh, feel free to, to come back at me on this, but I think <laughs> it's understanding the limitations of your source material, which yeah. allow a historian to say things with authority and accuracy, or to understand the limits of that uh, authority and accuracy. Mm -hmm. And I would never pretend to do that for a culture I don't understand properly. And mm -hmm. it would take me too long now to get up to speed for Know, the Middle East or India or China to be able to sort of pretend that I could well not to say the same things so I unapologetically stick to what I do know oh, that's and very I wise I think it would be unwise I would love it if somebody were to say I'm applying this idea to yeah. you know, the Far East I want to see somebody apply it to the Far East yeah. but I really can't do it myself Oh, well, that's a very wise position to take. So I'd like to end then by pulling it back to the act of history itself, because history also changes radically over time. And if we go back a couple of centuries, the period of the Middle Ages isn't even part of their histo historiography. The decisive break for British historians for in the 18th or 19th century is right after the fall of the Roman Empire and the subsequent rise of Christendom. We're talking around 500 AD. And then it's the long, slow road to modernity with the Renaissance fueling the modern world. So our common way of dividing European history into ancient, medieval and modern just simply wasn't a model for the, in, in the 18th and 19th century. So do you think that is also going to continue to change? Perhaps your period of 11th to 16th that seems unnatural to me as a trained medievalist, perhaps this is going to be the birth of something else with a different label on it. What do you think? I think we're at a, a, a bit like printing coincided with the number of political changes in the world, which saw most people come to a consensus that that's when the Middle Ages ended, for better or for worse, as a historiographical term. I think we're at a similar point now. And because we're going to end up ultimately with too many variations for easy communication, we're going to, I think, sort of find a new way of talking about the past. I th just as the Dark Ages now is a, a, a somewhat outdated term, and I can only think of one constructive use for it, and that's to describe a society that collapses so suddenly you can't actually see the evidence of its own collapse. Uh, and I, think I, would, I would only use the Dark Ages in that sense, but in the past people used it regularly. I think we're going to start to uh, look at the medieval term as being a bit, a bit old hat and a bit misleading, and I think we will start to find new ways of categorization. I don't feel myself in the position where I want to start labeling, you must see it this way, you must see it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's open to people to interpret. And there are times when it's much more specific to, much more useful to be specific and talk about it in the late 14th century or something rather than mm -hmm. medieval. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I do think we're going to move away from this term medieval in the long run. But society changes its attitudes very slowly. Yeah. And I think it's going to take a little while before we really appraise the, these centuries as a whole and the individual centuries within them in a, a, in a more appropriate way or more and more uh, open-minded way because this word medieval is now is, is more problematic than it is useful.
Ian Mortimer, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can buy Ian's new book, Medieval Horizons, Why the Middle Ages Matter, at all good bookshops and find the details of his previous books on his website, ianmortimer.com. This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Lydia Wilson. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favourite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.